Greetings, everybody. Welcome to another exciting lecture by your favorite speaker, Dr. Ronald J. Brown. Our topic for today is one of the great grand avenues of the world. Karl Marx Salle, formerly in East Berlin, now part of a reunited Germany and a reunited city of Berlin, is one of these grand avenues of the world. I've been, a fast, I've been fascinated by big cities and new cities, old cities, and I was impressed by the centrality of grand avenues, which really are a central feature of cities and have been since the most ancient times. In fact, a grand avenue is central to any well-designed city, whether it's ancient or the present. On the left, we see Utopia. The city has always been viewed as a microcosm of not only the universe, but of creation in itself. Massive north-south axes, east-west axes, such as in Beijing. So, a city is really a microcosm of what people hope and want from their lives and their existences here on Earth. So, let's get started. Well, Karl Marx Alle is one of those great cities that was a microcosm of the communist dream of a perfect society here on earth. The communists, as we all know, did not believe in heaven and hell and gods. It was basically up to us. If we were going to have heaven, it was going to be a heaven we would build here on earth. Don't wait until you die to go to heaven, and then you can have all the pepperoni pizza and Budweiser you could possibly want. Actually, the only thing we have is this life here on Earth. That's one of the reasons why the communists in China are so busily building big new cities and creating their earthly paradise. Because neither the communists nor the Confucianists nor the Buddhists believe in gods and heaven and hell and all those things. So don't sit around doing nothing and suffering and feeling sorry for yourself, a communist would say, but get off of your ass and go build the earthly paradise here on Earth. So our outline. A little bit of the background of Berlin as a relatively new city compared to other great cities of the world, such as Rome and Beijing, even Paris. Uh, Berlin is a relatively newcomer. World War II, massive destruction, really opened the door to rebuilding the city. And what did Karl Marx Alle represent? Well, it was a victory celebration of Karl Marx over Adolf Hitler. What is the Karl Marx Allee today? And it is still called Karl Marx Allee, even though it is now a center of a capitalistic German country. It is still Karl Marx Allee. So let's get started. Well, Berlin. If we look at the map of Europe in the 12, early 1200s, we see that the central feature was the Holy Roman Empire, which is basically centered, centered on Germany, Austria, Switzerland, the German-speaking parts of France, and down into Italy. And so the Holy Roman Empire of the German nation, as many people call it. And it was surrounded by smaller countries. You had Poland, uh, Little Republic, Silesia, Bohemia, which is a Czech Republic today. Hungary had carved out its empire to the south um, uh, east. France, uh, located in Paris, was uh, 
carving out its little country. In the north, we already had what would become Belgium and Holland and Denmark. Well, this was the result of the decline and fall of the Roman Empire. Rome, which had expanded and took everything from England down to Egypt and from Palestine over to Portugal and North Africa. When the barbarians invaded, they basically destroyed the Roman Empire. What remained was the Byzantine Empire in the year 1200, and it's called the Eastern Roman Empire or the Byzantine Empire based on Constantinople. But Western Europe basically was overrun by German and Hungarian tribes, and gradually they got organized enough so that by the 1200s you did have the emergence of a German empire called the Holy Roman Empire. Well, Europe had constantly been devastated by barbarian invasions. We had the barbarian Huns, the big yellow area, taking over China down to Vietnam, into India, Persia, all the way up, decimating the first capital of Russia, Kiev, and forcing the Russians to flee to the north, where they built the second capital of the Russian Empire in what is today Moscow. Well, other tribes were expanding, not just Huns not just the Magyars or the Hungarians or, or the Mongols. There were other tribes such as the Slavs, which emerged from what is today modern day Russia and Ukraine. And they too were expanding, going down and settling in what is today Bulgaria or Serbia, or taking over areas of Poland and going up into Bohemia and conquering the German tribes of what is today the Czech Republic. So Europe really has no frontiers. The United States is protected on both sides by Atlantic and Pacific Oceans. So we have never had barbarian invasions. Although the Native American Indians were barbarian invasions coming across from Mongolia. But in modern times, uh, Nobody has invaded the United States. And we have a, a, a little uh, a peaceful country of Canada to the north and a troubled but yet country to the south of Mexico. But Europe, and especially the German Empire, the Holy Roman Empire, was constantly fighting off barbarian invasions, Slavs, Mongols, Huns, Magyars, even Vikings from the north. So Germany really had no borders. There are no mountain ranges to protect it. It doesn't have an ocean on either side. So it was always a rather precarious uh, um, kingdom. In modern history, you know of uh, Napoleon invading Germany, Stalin invading Germany, the United States invading Germany. So, I mean, it is a country without natural borders. Well, here again, we see the Holy Roman Empire, which was expanding, taking over Burgundy, which is today part of France, northern Italy, uh, taking over Corsica, Sardinia, absorbing the kingdom of Bohemia, the Czech Republic, uh, and Hungarians are holding their own, the kingdom of Serbia, where the Slavs had settled in, Kingdom of Bulgaria, which was Slavic, Kingdom of Poland was growing and getting more powerful. Well, the main invaders to this Holy Roman Empire came from the east, where we see Russia, and that Siberia is where all of the big invaders had come from. So the Holy Roman Empire realized we have to defend our eastern flank. And so they built two big fortress cities to block any future invasions. On the left, you see the letter B. That is where Berlin was built, founded in 1237. And on the right, we see an outline of the 
the old city of Berlin on the Spree River, and you see it is surrounded by stone fortifications and a moat and then another fortification built on islands, whether natural or artificial. It was a defense against future barbarians. Below that, we see the letter V. Vienna was built also as a defensive city against barbarians. And so Berlin emerged into history, founded in 1237. Well, by then, Paris was already do dominated by Notre Dame Cathedral, London, Rome were great cities. And Berlin was a newcomer, filled with soldiers, the fort to protect against Slavic or other barbarians from the east. Well, Germany began to expand, and Berlin was the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia. And we see in the map on the right, East Prussia and West Prussia, with Berlin in the state of Brandenburg, um, Berlin was already a significant city. King, um, the, the king of Prussia was a major figure in European history. Well, from Berlin, the kings of Prussia started expanding and taking over their neighbors, Mecklenburg, Hanover, Saxony, even usurping the power of the Hohenzollern dynasty in the yellow area, which is Bavaria. Well, Germany finally, under William I, united what is today Germany. It went to war against France, and it liberated Alsace and Lorraine from the French, reuniting them with the, their ancient German homeland. My grandfather's family comes from Lorraine, and when Germany liberated Alsace and Lorraine. It was a glorious day in my family. They were no longer persecuted by the Catholic French, but the Protestants of Lorraine were once again part of Germany. Well, William I, who was king of Prussia, crowned himself emperor of Germany, Kaiser. And picture we see at the bottom is in the Palace of Versailles in Paris, because he had gone to war against France, occupied Paris, and had himself crowned as the new German emperor with his capital city in Berlin. So Berlin suddenly became not just the capital of the Kingdom of Prussia, but it became the capital of the Empire of Germany. Well, of course, Berlin had to be spruced up because it was now equal to Paris or London or Rome or Vienna or Madrid uh, or St. Petersburg as grand cities of the future. Well, in 1573, St. Petersburg was not yet there, but Moscow was the capital of Russia, filled with churches and palaces. And so the German Kaisers decided we have to build or rebuild Berlin, no longer as a fortress city against the barbarians, but as the capital of a great empire. Well, the first grand avenue that was laid out was Unter den Linden. Linden is the German name for lime trees. And on the left, you see the beautiful lime flowers. And on the map, you see it goes right and left through the heart of Berlin. 
On the right, we see all of the government buildings. Number 16 is the Humboldt University. There were cathedrals, magnificent museums, um, opera house, Catholic and Protestant cathedrals, libraries, embassies, statues lining the tree, lining the street, and the German parliament, the Reichstag, which is number two. Well, it goes from the royal palace and the cathedral to the left, the famous Brandenburg Gate was built later, and then it goes into the Tiergarten, which is a giant, magnificent park. So this was the Grand Avenue of the German Empire. This is where the emperor would ride up and down in his carriage on major events. Weddings and funerals were celebrated. Military victories were celebrated. And so this was the Grand Avenue of a new capital of a new empire. Here we see some of the older pictures of the Unter den Linden. See the linden trees? And you see how broad it is. In the distance at the top picture, you see the Brandenburg Gate. Again, you see it on the right, place of grand festivities. The bottom on the left, you see the Lutheran Cathedral, the grandest church of old Berlin. That is still standing, as is the Brandenburg Gate. Well, along came World War II, and the German Empire, as it had been in World War I, was defeated. Unter den Linden remained the main, uh, main grand avenue of the city. Well, Hitler had a plan under his architect, Albert Speer, to make Berlin even more grand. And his plan was to join the east-west axis of Unter den Linden with a new grand avenue, the Avenue of Splendor, the Prachtale, which would run north and south. So there'd be like a giant X carved into Berlin, the old Unter den Linden and the new Prachtale. And you can see the picture on the right. At the top of the picture, we see the new parliament for the German Empire, which was never built. But you see the Grand Avenue with a triumphal arch and government buildings and palaces, museums lining this Grand Avenue. Well, this was never built. As we all know, Hitler was defeated and that was the end of the Racht Allee. Hitler's plan was monumental. Under Albert Speer, he was going to rename Berlin Germania with the largest building ever built for the parliament, a hall of the people that could hold 180,000 people. On the right, another triumphal arch which would dominate the street. Well, of course, none of this was ever built. Germany was ruthlessly bombed during the war. By 1945, Hitler had fallen. The communists had seized a big chunk of Berlin and Germany. And the Allies, the French, the English, and the Americans had seized another big chunk of Germany and had taken over half of the city of Berlin. On the right, you see the ruins of Unter den Linden. You see the Brandenburg Gate still standing, heavily damaged, the buildings around it largely destroyed. The American Embassy was in this big square there. And of course, all the linden trees had been chopped down for firewood when Germany could not get enough coal or gas for the cold winters. So, 
Unter den Linden was still there. That was going to be and remain the main imperial street of Berlin. Berlin was divided. We had East Berlin, which was the green area, and then the French, the British, and the Americans uh, um, took another half of the city. The famous Berlin Wall was built down, and this was divided Berlin from 1949, the year I was born, until 1990. Berlin was an island inside of what became known as East Germany. If you look at the map on the right, you see big chunks of Poland, of uh, Germany, were handed over to the Russians, and Poland took a huge area of Germany. Germans were either killed or driven out, and Polish people came in and took over these big chunks of, Ger of Germany. East Germany was set up as a communist country, and the British, the French, and the American zones ended up establishing West Germany with the city of Bonn as its capital. But West Berlin remained an island isolated inside of East Germany. I remember taking the train and going by car from West Germany to West Berlin and then sneaking across, the, not sneaking, but going across the border to Checkpoint Charlie into East Berlin. Those were wonderful times um, to be experiencing um, Berlin. Well, Berlin was not the only city that was divided after World War II. Jerusalem. The Israelis conquered West Jerusalem, expelled the Palestinian population, and confiscated everything. The Jordanians occupied East Jerusalem, expelled all the Jews, confiscated everything. And from 1948 to 1967, Jerusalem was also a divided city. The five years I lived in Jerusalem were just following the reunification of, Jer of Jerusalem when the Israelis conquered East Jerusalem and demolished the wall and reunited the city and expanding it by taking over huge areas of uh, um, the West Bank and creating what is called Greater Jerusalem. So Berlin and Jerusalem had a very similar history, divided cities, cities of warfare. Well, when the communists took over East Berlin, they were intent on showing that Marxism was the victor. It was the superior ideology over Hitler. But they were also out to prove that Marxism was superior to capitalism. So Berlin, East and West, became the stage where the Cold War was fought, not so much militarily, but economically. The Western countries of so the United States, West Germany, Britain, France, uh, wanted to show that West Berlin could thrive and be beautiful and elegant as a capitalistic, democratic city. And the communists on the other side, East Berlin, were intent on showing that East Berlin could be a thriving, beautiful, prosperous city ruled by Marxism. So Berlin became the stage of one of the greatest battles of the Cold War, not militarily, but economically. Well, the competition between the United States, between the West and uh, the Soviet bloc became bloody in many places. We all know about the Vietnamese War, the Greek Civil War, the Berlin Airlift, where the Soviets tried to take over West Berlin, Cuban Missile Crisis, the Civil War in Nicaragua, the Korean War, right after the war, 
These were the bloody wars of the Cold War. There, it wasn't cold at all. It was very hot. But in Berlin, it was an economic warfare. West Berlin took over the Kurfürstendamm, the main shopping street of West Berlin, filled with beautiful stores selling the luxuries of the West, McDonald's, grand department stores. On the left, you see the U-Bahnhof, the subway of the Kurfürstendamm, Grand Avenue of West Berlin. Here, everything was available. In fact, to make Berlin, West Berlin, even more elegant, the German government basically allowed anybody to go there and live. You could work. You didn't have to pay taxes. The police were very tolerant of sexual minorities, of great wild discos, because they wanted people to live there to make West Berlin a Schaufenster, as they say in Germany, a display window of capitalism. So in Berlin, it was not an I military battle. It was an ideological conflict to show that West Berlin could be a heaven on earth, for the capitalists, and likewise, East Berlin could be heaven on earth for the communist world. <clears throat> now, of course, since Marxism had no God, there was no heaven, the communists were out to build their perfect human society and to forge their perfect human being here on Earth. So Marxism has a lot in common with Confucianism, which again, building the perfect human society on Earth. In the United States, groups were always trying to build the perfect society, saying that America was a new Garden of Eden, where the evils of old Europe would be forgotten, and America would become a heaven on earth. The Zionists, the first Israelis, said, we are going to get rid of all of this Jewish religion and superstition and go off to the land of Palestine, the land of Israel, and build our perfect society here on earth. This was the beginning of the kibbutz movement revitalization of the Hebrew language, what a friend of mine called the macho Jew. And it was the same thing that Hitler planned to do, building his Aryan, German, heaven on earth in the modern world. The fascists did the same thing, build a new Roman Empire where Italy would be ruled from Rome, and it would be another great world empire. We see that today with Donald Trump, make America great again. We see it with prior President Xi in China, make China great again. So all of these movements were building utopia. We see communist posters, images of a utopia here on Earth. Building utopia, erecting Russia's first modern city in 1930, even before the war, where we see massive housing development, schools, museums, opera houses, building the communist utopia in Russia. Architecture was central to this. You weren't going to have old buildings, palaces built by aristocrats and kings and Fifth Avenue robber barons, but you were going to have architecture for the masses, for everybody. 
so that in the communist world there would be no rich and there would likewise be no poor. There would be no hunger. Maybe you weren't eating caviar and drinking champagne, but nobody was going to starve. And so for the communists, building brand new cities, building utopia on earth was very important. The, stat the statues, the stamps, and the posters, workers of the world unite, work together to build the perfect society, the perfect family, women taking up a gun, defending Russia, working in factories, marching into a glorious future for men, for women, for children, for everybody in the world, according to the communist plan for the future. Well, that's where Karl Marx Allee comes into the picture. Berlin was the capital of the German Empire. It had been the capital of Nazi Germany, and it was destroyed during the war. Well, it was a unique occasion for rebuilding a city, but rebuilding it with a new ideology. And this was the plan that the communists had for rebuilding Berlin. The stamp in the middle, you see Nationales Aufbauprogramm. This is the National Rebuilding Program. Rebuilding. East Berlin. Below that, you see Deutsche Demokratische Republik. We call it East Berlin. They called it the German Democratic Republic. Well, these pictures show some of the ruins of the city. Again, on the right, you see the Brandenburg Gate with burnt out automobiles and buildings. Streets were lined with demolished buildings. On the left at the bottom, you see a subway station where the whole roof had been turned off or had been torn off. So the challenge was rebuilding East Berlin. <clears throat> well, a group of East German architects, Henselmann, Hartmann, Hopp, Leucht, Paulich, and Storandi, got together. Now, this is typically communist. I mean, not one person runs the show. It is a committee, a committee of six architects. And they were charged with a plan to lay out a new Grand Avenue, cutting through East Berlin and extending out into East Germany. Well, it was easy to carve out an avenue because most everything had been destroyed. It's not like when Robert Moses decided to carve out his Cross Bronx Expressway and had to demolish homes and entire neighborhoods. In Berlin, the destruction had already been done. And so it was possible to lay out on the map a grand avenue, build monumental buildings along each side. So this was a collectivism, meaning not one person was running the show, but it was a committee. And here we see the plan going from Alexanderplatz, which we see with the green buildings, Curving slightly at the Strasburger Platz, where we see the red, and then going down further to the Frankfurter Tour. Now, Alexander Platz was the central heart of East um, Berlin. It's the uh, Platz in German is a place or a square. And here we see the way it looked before the war, with the trolley, the subway, the elevated train, the department stores and everything. And uh, that is still today 
a large train station there, lots of shops and everything. And from there, you just walk down to the old Unter den Linden and the royal capital. Well, the plan for the Karamark Allee started at Alexanderplatz, which had been almost totally demolished in the war. And as you can see, buildings were built on both sides with a big square, at the Strasbourg Square, and then another one square at the Frankfurter Gate, lined on both sides with newly built, very socialistic looking buildings. Well, at the Alexanderplatz, that had been the heart of old Berlin, and it had been totally bombed. On the top, you see the royal palace of the German emperors, kings, and later Adolf Hitler. Well, that was totally demolished by American bombers who wanted to destroy any memory of old Germany from the map. So when the communists took over, the palace was in ruins. So they built this famous building on the right, which was the Parliament of Germany. So the Kaiser and Hitler gave way to a what the communists considered a democratic people's parliament. I remember going in there, they had a lovely, what they called it, a coffee shop or a, a milk cafe where you could get a decent cup of coffee and see all these people milling around. And it was a wonderful place. Well, that is no longer there because the new unified Germany is rebuilding the palace that you see on the left, or at least the exterior. The interior, of course, is all modern, but they're restoring um, the palace to make the Alexanderplatz reflect a little bit more of the history of Germany. Well, the communist idea for the Karl Marx Allee, as it was for the communist countries in their entirety, was that there would be no rich and no poor. You wouldn't have Trump Tower with Donald Trump's magnificent apartment on several floors. And just across the street, you would have homeless people or hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people living in public subsidized housing and living on food stamps. And so Fifth Avenue, which is the capitalist Grand Avenue, filled with stores for the rich, apartments for the fabulously wealthy, but yet in the streets, tens of thousands of homeless people, beggars, indigent people, people filling the public housing, living in virtual poverty. So Karl Marx Allee was not going to be another Fifth Avenue. These were the kinds of buildings that were built. Stores on the ground floor, nice pillared entrances, and identical apartments for the people. So there were no mansions. There were no Trump Towers. There were no luxury department stores. Everything was geared for the ordinary citizen. Many people said the nice thing about living in one of these apartments is you could visit your neighbors up and down the street and you never had to ask anybody where the bathroom was because you always knew. So this was housing for the masses. Now, of course, remember, Berlin, as was most of Europe, was so heavily bombed during the war that the goal was to build rapidly as quickly as you could to house the millions of people who had survived the war. And in Berlin, it was especially acute because millions of Germans had been expelled from Czechoslovakia, from Poland, from Russia, and the, those who survived became refugees. And so the need was to build fast, build simple, 
economical to house these millions of homeless people. Now, along the street were installations for the masses, the famous sport hall, where there were gyms and areas for working out. On the right, we see the Kino Internacional. This was one of the largest movie palaces uh, built in East Germany. Here again, it was a um, beautiful, ultra-modern building, not remembering Greek or Roman or Gothic or Byzantine architecture, but a new simplified architecture uh, for, built for the communist world. Behind it, you see another massive apartment building. Along the street in the middle picture, you see cafes where people could go in and have coffee or have something to eat. All of these buildings are still there. When the, the, Germany was reunited, um, the West Germans did not demolish anything. They didn't even change the name. It is still the Karl Marx Allee. And you can see how broad it is, lined with largely identical buildings. This is the famous Moscow Cafe and Restaurant. The mosaic were scenes from the life of peoples of the Soviet Union. Here again, the goal was not to have art for the rich people, but to take art to the streets so that passersby could see art. They could experience it, not have to go to a special building like the Metropolitan Museum, where it's all locked away in a building, but take art to the street. The architecture, again, was modern. And so this is another one of the buildings which still stands on Karl Marx Allee. Originally, under Joseph Stalin, it was called Stalin Alley, and there were statues of Joseph Stalin um, on the avenue as it was being built from 1949 after the war to 1961. On the left, you see a statue of Joseph Stalin. On the right, you see the street sign being taken down and replaced with Karl Marx Allee. In the middle, you see another scene with the monument to Joseph Stalin with a big red star and flags along it. If you look at this street too, you see how small all the trees are. If you look at the Champs-Élysées, or you see that the trees are huge, but in Berlin, everything was cut down for firewood during the war. Well, from Alexander Platz, you get down to the Stausberger Platz, which once again is marked by big, beautiful monuments, uh, um, architecture, um, memorials, uh, um, once again showing that it is not a street of rich department stores, and palaces for Donald Trump, but it is a street for the people. And again, you see the massive apartment buildings um, housing thousands of people, ground floor, restaurants, shopping centers, uh, gyms, bookstores, uh, um, everything for the masses. One of my favorite places is the Café Sibyl, where they recreate the stories uh, and the world of the early Stalin Alley and later Karl Marx Alley. Of course, the communists had to mass produce everything cheaply and quickly. The first televisions, little tables, stoves, heating units, uh, um, even the paintings on the wall were done to bring art into for 
the masses. The cafe is nice because it has all kinds of memorabilia from the golden age of East Berlin. You see drawings for the buildings, proposals for monuments, uh, and all kinds of other memorabilia. So it's like a little museum inside a cafe. The next big stop is the Frankfurter Tour. Tour in Germany means a tower. Uh, and this is named after the German cities of Frankfurt, one which was in East Germany and, and, and the Oder and Frankfurt on Main in West Germany. And here again on the right, you see the two towers on top of an apartment building. And from where we are standing in this picture on the right uh, at the bottom, you see the straight stretch of the tower going up and that tall building with a little bubble on top, that was the radio broadcasting tower for East Berlin. But you can see how wide the street is, actual parks on both sides filled with trees and the beautiful Frankfurter Tour. Once again, the buildings are white, apartment buildings built for the masses. This is another view of it showing the Frankfurter Tour at the top of the picture and then continuing down um, into the bottom corner and up to the Alexander Platz. Well, in the middle picture, you see, again, one of the stores, uh, the uh, bookstores uh, with the old German, East German automobiles, statues of Karl Marx, 1818, 1883, are still um, uh, lining the street. Nothing has been changed. <laughs> Well, the Grand Avenues around the world, whether it's Fifth Avenue or Broadway or the Champs-Élysées in Paris or the Paseo de la Reforma in Mexico City or the Grand Axis of Beijing, a Grand Avenue is more than just a reflection of the social economic situation of the country. Grand Avenues become stages. Think of the St. Patrick's Day Parade and Gay Pride Parade on Fifth Avenue, Victory Parades up and down Broadway, Ticker Tape Parade, celebrating victory in war. Well, Karl Marx Allee was a sign, a symbol of the victory of communism over Nazism and over capitalism. Well, it also became the stage for the East German uprising in June 1953. The Berlin Wall had gone down. The East Germans were not allowed to leave. They saw that the situation was getting more and more oppressive under communism. And they had suffered under the Kaiser. They had suffered under Hitler and they had little desire to suffer under Joseph Stalin. And so they rose in revolt, the famous East German uprising. Well, of course, like every uprising, it was put down brutally by the Soviet and East German military. But it was another chapter of of the Karl Marx Allee. Karl Marx Allee was also the scene for the grand May Day celebrations. May Day is the day of labor for every country except the United States. Why doesn't the United States celebrate May Day in May? Well, what was May Day? It was when the National Guard, the Pinkertons, and the city of Chicago brutally suppressed a labor strike in Chicago, 
killing people, arresting the leaders, one of the most brutal suppression of the American movement to form labor unions. Well, it was so brutal and so bloody that Americans don't want to remember it. So we have our own Labor Day in the fall for no apparent reason. But the rest of the world still remembers this brutal attack on labor movement. Well, in East Berlin, as in every city in the Soviet world, May Day was a day of major celebrations. On the left, you see a poster at the top. It says, Alle Länder vereinigt euch. All the workers of all of every country get united. And you see um, uh, posters of leaders, the red flags. On the right, you see the East German Federal Parliament with the still ruined cathedral on the left. Well, every nation that was communist, even communist movements in the United States and South America and Africa would send delegations to the major capital cities of the communist world. So on May Day, East Berlin was filled with hundreds of thousands of people, delegates from every communist country and non-communist country of the world, marching up and down the Karl Marx Allee. Delegations from North Vietnam, North Korea, Mongolia, China, from Poland, from Bulgaria, and delegations from Brazil and Argentina and Colombia, Mexico, even the United States, where the Communist Party was largely suppressed, but still it managed to exist. The stamp on the right, again, the German Democratic Republic, but at the top, it is a stamp commemorating Berlin's Stalin Allee um, from before the name change. So this was a major glorious moment for these parades, marching from the East German parliament on the right, the big white building, marching down the Karl Marx Allee, celebrating the uh, victory of the working people of the world. <clears throat> Well, the street would be lined with political um, um, uh, protest signs. Um, uh, the, the truck on the left, it says, Social socialism will be victorious. On the right, you see Vietnam, the unbesiegbaren. Uh, Vietnam, the undefeated. Here again, posters celebrating the victory, eventual victory of the, the Vietnamese over the Americans and the French. So, Karl Marx Allee became a main stage for enacting heroic events. Well, Karl Marx Allee today remains one of the great avenues of the world. Like the Champs-Élysées, it is a grand avenue of the world. Books, Karl Marx Allee und Interbau, 1957 the Karl Marx Allee and its construction, history book of this um, grand avenue. Philip Johnson, the New York, one of the greatest American architects, described the Karl Marx Allee is city planning on a grand scale. Aldo Rossi described it as Europe's last great street. Champs-Élysées has been there for three centuries. The Grand Avenues and the Mall in London and Nevsky Prospect in St. Petersburg have been here for a long time. 
but it was Karl Marx Alle, which, according to Rossi, was the last great avenue of Europe. Well, I lived in Berlin uh, for the summer of 1971, from March to June. Back in those wonderful days, it was East Berlin. And as you can see from my passport stamp on the right, you see DDR, German Democratic Republic, showing that I had gone to West, to West Berlin by car. And then Checkpoint Charlie, see Checkpoint Charlie in the middle, where I would go through and go from West Berlin to East Berlin for a day. And so this is part of the history. That's what I looked like back in 1969. So um, uh, I have changed a little bit, I guarantee you, or now at the age of 74. Well, the passage was Checkpoint Charlie. Well, of course, now with the unification of East and West Berlin, Checkpoint Charlie, the little building is still there, but it is a tourist site. In the distance beyond Checkpoint Charlie, where you see the French and the, and the British flags and the American flags, uh, in the distance you see the, the um, Berlin Wall. Well, when I was in Berlin, I worked in a grocery store, Lebensmittelgeschäft, and uh, um, would take foods from West Berlin, and I would take them through Checkpoint Charlie as much as I was allowed to, and I would take them and sell them in East Berlin, and I would have enough money for a wonderful uh, day in East Berlin. Well, East Berlin was, in many ways, a heaven on earth, not just because of the uh, Karl Marx Allee, but the museum island that you see in the upper right picture was all located in East Berlin. There you see the cathedral, and uh, at the top right-hand corner, you see the old royal palace, and in the middle of the picture, you see the famous museum in the Museum Island. Well, also in East Berlin was the Opera House, concert halls. The cultural center of Berlin was part of East Berlin. So it was well worth a visit. And I, of course, I could stay for, I think it was 12 hours at the time. So when I would go through Checkpoint Charlie, I would have a plastic bag with either a dozen bananas or a dozen oranges, which were very difficult to find in East Berlin, except at Christmas and major holidays. But I would take them across. I would sell a dozen oranges or bananas on the black market. I went to a certain cafe and sat, and I would sell them very often, one banana or one orange. And I would get enough East German marks so that I could invite all of my East German friends to go to the op, to go to restaurants, to go to the coffee shops. And we would have a wonderful time. I'd even sometimes get on a train and I would leave East Berlin, which was illegal, and go to parties in East Germany. Uh, if I would have been caught, I would have been um, probably um, teaching English in Siberia today. East Berlin was proud of its heritage. There you see the Brandenburg Gate. At the bottom, you see the museums. You see the um, 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 university. Uh, you see the oldest church in Berlin in the upper right. So it was in East Berlin that there was so much to see and so much to do, even though it was a communist world, but the heart of Berlin was in the East. Well, I went back to Berlin in um, uh, December 3rd, 1990. Um, and of course, the Berlin Wall had gone. And the remnants were still there. All the young East Germans were go 
going over to the discotheques in West uh, Berlin. Well, you could always tell who was an Ossi, which means in East Berlin, and who was a West Berliner, because for some reason, the socks that guys wore were much higher, went higher up your leg in West Germany, but in East Germany, the socks were much shorter. So when a guy would sit down, you could tell whether he was from the East or the West because if he was from the West, the sock went well up into his pant leg. But he was, he was from the East, the sock was shorter. And so you'd always see a stretch of his bare leg. So that's how you could always tell the difference between the East and the West. Well, it was, of course, a wonderful experience to see the end of the divided city. Checkpoint Charlie, with a little building, or at least a recreation of it, is still there. On the left, you see the Maurer Museum, the Museum of the Wall. And on the right, in what was formerly East Berlin, of course, McDonald's has moved in. And so this is the remnant of Checkpoint Charlie. People like to go up there and get their picture taken. Well. Francis Fukuyama, in 1993, as the communist world was collapsing, wrote his famous book, The End of History, where he said that with the demise of the communist system, the world was going to become capitalistic. It was the age of globalization. German businessmen flooded into Russia and Eastern Europe doing business. Well, Unter den Linden remained a beautiful street, but the most popular street these days is the Karl Marx Allee. In fact, it seems every weekend some grand event is happening. It has what it claims is the largest beer festival on the face of the earth. It goes for miles. Every country has its stand and is celebrating its beer. So if you want Mongolian beer or Tibetan beer, or you want beer from Ecuador, well, this is the place to go and to drink your beer. Well, when I visit Berlin, I stay in what was formerly the East Berlin half, because when the East Germans would be celebrating May Day or some other grand holiday, and all of these delegations from around the world would flood into Berlin, they had to be housed. And so this building, City Hostel Berlin, which we see today, and on the right, we see the same building, is a hostel. And that's where I stay. Stay there's 2017, 2019. And uh, this was built by the North Koreans who housed their thousands of delegates who would go to Berlin for May Day. Well, with the demise of May Day and all these communist holidays, uh, the North Korean government simply transformed the building into a hostel. Where I, I always say at hostels, I'll get a room with four beds, two bunk beds, because it's a small number of people, you get to know each other, you meet interesting people. If you're cheaper, you know, then you can get in a dorm where there'll be 20 or 30 beds. They have a cafeteria at the bottom with cheap meals, TV room, books, and all that. Well, I stayed there, and I didn't notice when many times I stayed there. As you can see from the picture on the right, you see the Embassy of the Democratic People's Republic of Korea, which we call North Korea. They still own the building. And I stay there and city hostel. Well, it never dawned on me that I was supporting the North Korean economy. It never dawned on me that I was engaged in anti-American activities 
by staying in the North Korean hostel. Well, of course, nobody was aware of that uh, when we were staying there. We didn't. We just sort of thought that the embassy of the North Koreans was just a building beside it and never paid much attention to it. Well, I soon found out once when I was returning to the United States and I had the receipt from the city hostel and I had just tucked it in my passport and the security guys at the airport said, ah, oh, you were staying in a North Korean hostel. Do you realize that this is illegal? You could be arrested. Well, he then laughed because um, what could he do? But one of those wonderful experiences of travel. Well, this street, this Grand Avenue, the Karl Marx Allee, gives us an insight into the architecture in the age of Stalin or Soviet architecture. Ultra-modern architecture for the masses, doing away with the multi-million dollar mansions and apartments on Fifth Avenue, where at the entrance you see a gang of homeless people. The goal was a street for the people, where everyone would be housed, everyone would be equal. Well, of course, with the collapse of communism, we tend to ignore the co um, contributions that the communist world made to architecture for the masses. But we still see it in places like China, which is communist, building tens of thousands of identical apartment buildings to house the millions of Chinese moving into the cities so that there would be no poverty. And so it's a fascinating chapter in the history of architecture, to say nothing of the history of Berlin. Well, another experience I had when I was there was the Great Trabot Festival. Here you see how um, uh, the um, um, avenue looks today. Well, the Trabot was the classic East German automobile. Small, cheap, simple, but like the Volkswagen built by Hitler, the people's car, well, the Traubat was the people's car for East Berlin and East Germany, even exported to other communist countries. And so until today, they have rallies where those who have managed to find a Trabot and restore it, uh, drive it proudly in one of the grand parades down the Karl Marx Allee. There's even a Trabot USA club where Americans buy Trabots um, and they have clubs and rallies and here we see one of the rallies going through the old Checkpoint Charlie. And it's sort of uh, like collecting vintage cars in the United States. Another one of the big popular events down the Karl Marx Allee. This is the famous beer festival, Pro Beer de Welt in favor of beer of the world. This is the Belgian beer shop. On the right, you see again the um, gateway. Well, the problem is when you get hundreds of thousands of people drinking beer, um, beer goes right through you like beer. And so you drink half a bottle of beer and you have to pee. And so they put up these temporary urinals along the streets uh, where you can go up and pee. Women have to stand in line because they don't haven't come up with a free hugging seat for women to um, get rid of their beer. Plus, guys tend to drink more beer uh, than uh, women. So they um, pee. And sometimes even these are so... Uh, there's a line waiting to pee there. But this is uh, 
one of the um, challenges of having a giant outdoor beer festival. So that brings us to an end of our visit to the Karl Marx Allee. Well, as I mentioned at the very beginning, every civilization, every major city wants to have a Grand Avenue as its show piece. The Baron Haussmann carved out the Champs-Élysées, the Avenue de l'Opéra in Paris. When the Brazilian government decided to leave the coastal city of Rio and build a brand new city in the interior of Brazil, it laid out a Grand Avenue. And that's me standing in Brasilia with the Grand Avenue behind me. On the right is the Cathedral, the National Library, National Museum, Government Ministries, and just behind my head, before you fall into a lake, is the Brazilian Parliament, the Palace of the President of Brazil, and the headquarters of the Supreme Court. So any city of the future is going to have a grand avenue. And new cities are being built all the time, whether it's Abuja, the new capital of Nigeria, Astana, the new capital of Kazakhstan. Peter the Great laid out a grand avenue, Nevsky Prospect, when he laid out his new city of St. Petersburg. George Washington laid out Pennsylvania Avenue when he devised his plan for a new American capital named Washington, D.C. So if any of you are thinking of building a brand new city, or when we get to the point where we're establishing cities on Mars or Jupiter, a grand central avenue is going to be a requirement. So thank you for joining me today. This is Ronald J. Brown, and I will be... You can contact me if you would like by going to ronbrownmedia at gmail.com. So thank you for joining me, and I hope to see you in the future. Bye-bye.